Hi, I'm John the Engineer Turmel, and tonight I'm going to participate in the saddleback debate between Barack Obama and John McCain, their first debate. There's a chance there's going to be a North American Union, and if ever there were, I'd be running for President or Prime Minister of that Union, so I may as well take this opportunity to explain what I could do for not only Canada, but the United States and the world as well. So I'm going to be throwing in my answers and one-liners to these uh, arguments made by the other candidates, and I hope you appreciate the errors they're making and the ways they could be fixed. What's the most significant, let me ask it this way, what's the most gut-wrenching decision you've ever had to make and how did you process that to come to that decision? Well, you know, I, I, I think the, the opposition to the war in Iraq was uh, as tough a decision as I've had to make. Mm -hmm. okay. um, not only because there were political consequences, but also because mm -hmm. uh, Saddam Hussein was a real bad person. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was no doubt that he meant America ill. Well, Saddam may have wished America ill, but he didn't have the resources. He'd been blown up by George Bush Sr. Economic embargoes cost half a million dead Iraqi babies. Necessary, said Madden and Albright, you know. And uh, he was flat on his back, the whole country. Which explains to me why America attacked. They like attacking people who are flat on their back with no way to defend themselves. Uh, but I was firmly convinced at the time that uh, we did not have strong evidence of weapons of mass destruction. Worse, the U.S. government produced the false evidence to frame Iraq. Colin Powell gave up his dignity and his reputation at the United Nations, peddling a pack of lies in the cause of war. So it was a lot worse than just not sufficient evidence of weapons of mass destruction from a country that it was devastated and had no resources and couldn't even keep its babies alive. And there were a lot of questions uh, that, as I spoke to experts, mm -hmm. um, kept on coming up. Do, do we know how the Shia and the Sunni and the Kurds are going to get along mm -hmm. in a post-Saddam situation? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's, our, uh, what's our assessment as to how this will affect the, the battle against terrorists like al-Qaeda? Mm -hmm. um, have we finished the job in Afghanistan? Yeah, Barack wants to finish the job in Afghanistan, going after the Taliban who helped Al-Qaeda and mastermind bin Laden do 911. Well, there's a whole 911 truth movement who don't believe that bin Laden could have taken down three skyscrapers with two plane loads of gasoline. A lot of people don't believe that bin Laden could have tricked the NORAD to stand down. A lot of people just don't believe. And that means that people like me, who don't believe in these fairy tale conspiracies of the U.S. government, we have to conclude that the Al Qaeda and the Taliban and Bin Laden didn't do 911. So we're chasing the wrong guys in Afghanistan. And then to have Sheriff George Bush get the Canadians to be the patsy posse chasing the innocent victims in Afghanistan just must be the cherry on George Bush's cake. Anyway, keep in mind. Al Qaeda and Bin Laden didn't do 911, and if they didn't do 911, and the U.S. administration did it for an insurance scam or some other reason, war in Iraq, oil. The point is, we're chasing the wrong guys, and Afghanistan is an immoral war, just as immoral as Iraq. It was long ago, and and uh, and far away in a uh, in a prison camp in North Vietnam. My father was a high-ranking admiral. Uh, the Vietnamese came and said that I could uh, leave prison early. And we had a code of conduct that said you only leave by order of capture. So Senator P.O.W. McCain's biggest decision was whether or not to follow the code of conduct. Pretty puny compared to Mr. Obama's answer. Uh, the first one is, is Christianity. Now, you've made no doubt uh, about your faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, what does that mean to you? What does it mean to you to trust in Christ? And what does that mean on a daily basis? I mean, what does that really look like? Well, uh, as a starting point, it means I believe uh, in that, that, that Jesus Christ died for my sins and, mm -hmm. and that I am redeemed uh, mm -hmm. through him. Mm -hmm. uh, it, that is a source of strength and sustenance on a daily basis. Uh, 
Yeah, I know that I don't walk alone. Yeah. Uh, and I know that if I can uh, get myself out of the way, mm -hmm. that uh, you know, uh, I, I can maybe carry out in some small way uh, what, uh, what he intends. Hmm. Uh, and it means that uh, uh, those sins that I have on a uh, fairly regular basis, hopefully, will be washed away. <laughs> um, you know, but, but what it also means, I think, is uh, a sense of obligation to uh, embrace not just words, but through deeds, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the expectations, I think, that, that God has for us. Mm -hmm. and, and that means um, thinking about the least of these. It means uh, acting, uh, well, uh, acting justly and mm -hmm. loving mercy and, and walking humbly. Okay. Uh, with, with our God. And, and, and that, I, I think trying to apply those lessons on a daily basis, knowing that you're going to fall a little bit short each day, yeah. and being able to kind of take note and saying, well, that didn't quite work out the way I think it, it should have, yeah. but maybe I can get a little bit better. Um, it, it gives me the confidence to try things, and including things like running for president, that, <laughs> uh, where uh, you're going to screw up once in a while. Yeah. Jesus didn't save us from our sins so we would have heaven in the future. Jesus was here to save us from our debts so we could have heaven on earth. His Our Father was, give us today our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's the true interpretation of the Our Father. Jesus was a debt fighter. He defined interest in this way. To those who have abundance will more be given. And from those who have no abundance, even what they have will be taken away. I call it reverse Robin Hood. Well, they said, Jesus, what should we do with our abundance, our spare seeds? He said, Paul Corinthians 2, chapter 8, 14, your abundance should at the present time be a supply for their want. So their abundance can later be a supply for your want. And in that way, he who gathers much doesn't have too much, and he who gathers little doesn't have too little that there be equality. So the way to spread the world wealth around is not to take from the rich to give to the poor, to stop the current taking from the poor to give to the rich with interest. It's simply to have the rich help the poor get rich too by the rich lending interest free to the poor and hoping to get it back. Now remember, Jesus said, lend expecting nothing in return. And of course, you can expect to be treated the same way if you're ever in trouble too. And that's basically Christian credit. Now, it, a lot of it's been erased. The Thomas um, Gospel, verse 95, Jesus said, if you have money, do not lend it out at interest. Better you should give it to someone who can't pay you back. And guess what? Muhammad said the same thing. If you have money, do not lend it out at interest. Better you should give it to someone who can't pay you back. And as a matter of fact, Nehemiah for the Jews and Isaiah and all the good ones, Nehemiah said, let the exacting of interest stop. So all the great religious history personages and saints and prophets all condemn loan sharking, including Jesus. So Jesus in his Our Father said, pray for deliverance from your debts. He didn't say, Pray for deliverance from your sins. And that corruption of the New Testament, our Father, was done recently. In the old day, it was actually give us today tomorrow's bread, which is even better than today's bread, as well as forgiving our debt. So basically he said, if you got an account at the Sugar Daddy Bank of Canada or U.S. Treasury so that you can cut all your checks and deal only with one bank, well, you're not chasing anyone for debts. No one's chasing you for debts. And you got tomorrow's bread. Call that heaven on earth. I'm here to deliver heaven on earth. I'm here to engineer heaven by abolishing interest rates in international finance and basing collateral for loans not only on gold and on stuff, but on human time. And if you Google for time standard of money, you'll come up with my presentation at the United Nations at the 2000 Millennium Assembly, where Resolution C6 to restructure the global architecture, financial, suggested they use an alternative time-based currency. So people 
most time has to become collateral for loans. And that's why around the world you have all these time banks that are starting up. People list the things they want to do and they start cutting checks to each other in IOUs for time instead of money. Of course, the hour is linked to the basic wage of a country, but between countries we take trade time. So you do some research. Go Google for let's time dollars, time banks, and see what's happening around the world as people fight to establish their time and manpower as collateral for loans at the new interest-free sugar daddy bank. Means I'm saved and forgiven. I wouldn't bet on it. You voted for wars, you dropped bombs on innocent people, you have a lot of answering to do when you get to heaven.